if you compare what Jackson State is right now to where they were last year at their spring game, they're in a much better place in two vital positions. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. Thank you for going on this journey with me. Make a Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Bless me. Thank you. Shout out to my boy, Quentin Williams from the Jets. I always want to do that. But anyway, we're wrapping today's episode with a look at the standouts from the HBCU All-Star game. Prior to that, we'll look at North Carolina A&T, who is making their mark on the national landscape through their hurdlers this year. They always have something new out there in Greensboro. But we kick off today's episode out there in Jackson, Mississippi with Jackson State because the Jackson State Tigers are in a significantly better place April 2024 than they were in April 2023. And this comes in two particular places, right? Like, we still have to see how the season will play out. So there's no way to guarantee that they'll be better this year than they were last year. But as we sit here in April, and we know spring practice is all about projecting, I think that Jackson State is in a much better place than they were a year ago. And I have two particular positions and maybe position is the wrong way to wrong place to say it, but more so two particular spots, coach and quarterback coach isn't necessarily a position and they have the same coach. It's still TC Taylor. That's who it was last spring practice. That's who it is this spring practice. But I think that TC Taylor is in a better spot. So now Jackson state is in a better spot because of that, right? Because He's a first-year head coach in 2023. He's trying to figure things out. And I understand, as good as he may have been as a positional coach, as, as a coordinator, as an assistant coach, like no matter what he did, I don't think that it could have fully prepared him for what he was stepping into as a head coach. There was just an extra set of responsibilities that were going to be placed upon his shoulders. And maybe he was aware of those. But it's just extremely doubtful that he was perfectly prepared. There was going to be some growing pains. I predicted that. And I said that last year. This isn't something that was new to me. I think that there are pre predictable growing pains that come with being a first-year head coach, especially when he was a first-year head coach anywhere. Like, this was his first coaching opportunity. So now that he's gone through that, those growing pains are done. He can truly step into being an experienced head coach, not as experienced as a seven year, 10 year veteran, but he's experienced enough to know this is how I want to operate in spring practice. These are the things I like to do. Maybe those things I tried last year. I'm not really a fan of those. Let's throw those away and we're not going to carry them over into 2024. All of these things are real. And then one thing that he had to deal with last year that he doesn't have to deal with this year is creating a roster because we know what happened. Jackson State was in such a state of flux. There were so many things. And, and, and one of the things that's funny with Jackson State is, you know, I acknowledge these things. And, and in, a, in a sense, I gave them a pass. I will say it didn't seem like fans wanted to be given a pass at that time. And I kind of feel like fam, you might be in a similar situation where the fans don't want to give a, a pass but I think that there are certain growing pains that are going to come along with it 
but you know what? Let's not even go on that tangent because that was going to go somewhere completely left. Also, for those who already went with me, James Colsey does have head coaching experience. All right, you don't need to tell me. I understand that. But let's keep it on where I'm at. Last year, T.C. Taylor had to fill out a complete roster. There were so many people who left. There was They were in a greater state of flux than FAMU was this year or will be this year. And this is something that T.C. said about building a roster last, last season. He said, SWAT coaches are kind of where I was last year, kind of an uphill battle, fighting through, trying to build rosters, trying to keep players there. So with us, Jackson State, Having so many guys coming back, I think we are right where we need to be as a football team going forward. And not having to replace the whole team will do that for you. Like not having to replace multiple premier positions will have to do that. We'll do that for you. And one place they don't have to replace is quarterback, which is another reason I feel like they're in a better place. Jacoby and uh, almost a Howard Jacoby and Morgan is your starting quarterback. Last year, you couldn't say that at this time. Not because it wasn't Jacoby and Morgan, but because you just didn't know. You go into the spring splitting time. Players are are fighting for this position. And yes, competition can be good and it can bring the best out of players. But you also have to understand that when you're competing, you're dividing up first team reps. And first team reps can be very good for people as well. And I think that Morgan not having to worry about not looking over his shoulders, not about being concerned about losing your spot. It's about being able to get acclimated to the offense even better. See, Morgan is in a different position than Jason Brown was last year. Maybe Jason Brown just wasn't the guy. I don't know. Maybe maybe that just wasn't him. Maybe it didn't matter what it was going to be. Some people just don't have it. So maybe that was the case for him. But not only does Morgan not have to compete with other people, not only does Morgan get all of the first team reps, not only are those two things true, he also has starting experience in this system from last year. In Jackson State, he has starting experience. So. To me, that leaves the quarterback, that alone, everything that builds up to it, all the process. I'm not speaking about the talent because who knows? Maybe Morgan will end up not capitalizing either. The, the time will tell. But the process that Jackson State is going to, going through, excuse me, the process that Jackson State is going through, in my opinion, is just more conducive to success for the quarterback. So those are the two places that they're better. A coach with more experience, a coach with some experience under his belt. And then a quarterback who has more experience in Jackson State. Now, one last thing that I wanted to point out between these guys is the or after these guys is the trenches for Jackson State and the greatness of the defensive line, the weakness of the offensive line and what it means. Right. So T.C. Taylor commended the defensive line, but then also in a way, not even in a way, he reprimanded the offensive line. So this is T.C. Taylor's quote. I'm still trying to get this team to understand the physicality in the trenches. That's the part I did not see out there today. The D-line did bring it up front, the offensive line. They're big, but we need to be more physical and run the football. I don't think we did our best job of that. Irv, Mer Irv, Morgan. Irv Mulligan is your starting running back. Big Five knows how to tote the rock. We saw it last year. This is one of the best, if not the best, returning running back in the SWAC. Every year seems to be somebody who pops out. Uh, two years ago was Jarvion Howard. Um, last year it was Ladarius Owens, even though he had been there before. That was really his pop out season. Maybe this year it'd be Irv Mulligan. He doesn't quite fall in that category because I felt like he was already popping out last year. That's the guy that I'm looking for. The D line, they were strong. They appear to continue to be strong. They stopped the run. They beat up on the offensive line in the passing game as well, forced a bunch of quarterback runs and some sacks. The offensive line has to be better because it doesn't matter how talented that Jacoby and Morgan is. It's irrelevant if you can't block for him. It doesn't matter about Irv Mulligan and how good he is if he has to consistently make people miss in the backfield. Those are not recipes for success. The trenches can destroy everything. The defensive line getting no pressure doesn't matter how long that your, your cornerbacks can cover. Right? It, it doesn't matter. Your offensive line not being able to block doesn't matter how talented that your skill positions are. The trenches have to be fortified. The defensive line, they're doing a good job, and they seem like they're on the way to fortification. Meanwhile, the offensive line, there's still some work that needs to be there. Emphasis on needs. Now, as you push forward, let's go to somebody who doesn't need the improvement, somebody who's already very highly ranked on a national level. 
And I'm looking at North Carolina A&T track and field because this is what they do. And they do it pretty well. This year, it's just the hurdlers who are highlighted. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. <sighs> the NCAA tournament is over. No more March Madness. No more multiple games a day. No more of that, that chaos. And now it's time for the NBA playoffs. Now it's time for the MLB because the MLB is every single day. You look at the NHL. Every single they all of these these sports play a bunch of games, so there's a bunch of opportunities for you to make a little bit of cash. All you have to do is go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's land or excuse me, fanduel.com slash locked on. And we want to make it special for you. So if you put down a five dollar bet, win or lose, you will get a hundred and fifty dollars back in bonus bets. It's just that simple. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on and you'll get a hundred and fifty dollars back in bonus bets no matter what you do. NBA, NHL, MLB, go ahead and make some money for you. Fanduel.com slash locked on. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen, make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports today. It's the first of its kind, 24-7 live sports network on YouTube. So go to fan or excuse me, the Locked on Sports today and subscribe. My mixed messages are mixing up today, aren't they? But that's okay because one thing I'm not mixed up about is how talented that North Carolina a t really is. At track and field, their hurdles this year are setting the tone, but they have been elite in track and field for years. At this point, this is what they do. At this point, you can trust in the Aggies to get on the track, get in the uh, the, the field events, and they will excel. Like, this is trustable at this point. This year, I want to highlight, and it's just early in the outdoor season, but early in the outdoor season, I want to highlight North Carolina a ts hurdlers, their men's hurdlers to be specific. and. When we're speaking about a and it doesn't feel like we speak about them in the realm of HBCUs. It doesn't seem like we really speak about them in the realm of regionals. It feels like when North Carolina a t track and field is being discussed, we speak nationally. Today is no different. Their 400-meter team, excuse me, 400-meter hurdle team and their 110 hurdle team is looked at as one of the best in the nation. And it, it made me take it back. I said, team. You know, like I'm still trying to get the the lingo and the terminology. I said, team, I, I didn't think they had a 400 meter hurdle. Didn't think they had a 110 meter hurdle. Like, what do you mean, team? So I did a little bit of research, right? And I want to give that to you in case you were like me, because I know there are some people who are like, team, what do you mean by that? So event squad rankings explain. This is what they are. The USTFCCCA event squad rankings place places a rank order to a program squad of athletes in a particular event using cumulative season best qualifying marks from a team's top four ranked athletes on the national descending order list. As with national descending order list for qualifying and seating purposes, marks are subject to be converted due to track size and or altitude. A team must have four or more athletes with a valid season best mark to achieve a ranking in a particular event. To sum all of that up, they take the four best 400 meter hurdlers, the four best 110 hurdlers, and they say, this is your team. That's the, just the summary of it. That's the best way to say it. But I wanted to give you all of the information first and then summarize it. Um, for the 400 meter hurdles, that was Avion Reed, Thomas Smith, and then the twin brothers of Isaiah and Xavier C uh, Taylor. Excuse me. So Reed gave the Aggies a big boost at the Raleigh relays at the Raleigh relays. He ran his season best in his first 400 meter hurdle race of a 50 53. And remember we're looking at event squad of just melding people together. So this isn't a bunch of people running the 400 hurdles all together. Boom, 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 boom. This is not four laps. This is one lap per person and just taking what each person did in their one lap. Right. Sometimes you see that you've seen people do it with a projective Four by one, I've seen that, where you take four of the fastest 100 meter hurdlers or 100, yeah, 100 meter sprinters, excuse me, and you say, oh, if you put them on a four by one, this is what they would run, right? That that's essentially this. This is hypothetical. This is just kind of um, guessing together what they would make, right? But they put the four four 
runners together and then they divide it up to get the average time. So Reed jumped out and he would with his 50 53, that ended up being one of the best times in the nation, not just for North Carolina AT. That was one of the best times in the nation. And with that, they ended up being first. They were actually number one in the 400 meter hurdles in the initial event squad rankings. That was a week ago. Then yesterday, as I was crafting this, I say, okay, it's the ninth. Let me go ahead and wait a second before they release these new ones before I type too much. And now we have updated, right? Because Xavier Taylor, he improved his time from 52.69 to a 52.18. And that was able to bring up, excuse me. Yeah, I think I'm saying that wrong right way. But the average got better. It improved the average time for North Carolina A&T. And he was the only one to improve the time. So that was it. But unfortunately, A&T did drop down a couple of spots. Now they find themselves at fifth. And it was more so about guys just improving their time. Like North Carolina A&T was one at a 52.04. And then Texas A&M was right behind them at 52.05. Now, while North Carolina A&T did improve their standing, their timing, their average is better. Other people did as well, you know, and you'll see that in the 110 hurdle because that's also where they excelled at. And that's basically the same squad. You just change out Xavier Taylor for Jason Holmes. That's it. You still have Isaiah Taylor. You still have Thomas Smith. You still have Avion Reed. You still have all of those players, but you just get rid of one of the twin brothers and replace him with Jason Holmes. They were number three. Yeah, they were number three in the nation at the time last week. This, this week, you see a team like Houston. I think Houston jumped 37 spots. That was either in the 100 hurdles or the 100 meter dash. Um, like You can't control some of these things. A team like Iowa. Iowa jumped up. Like, where the heck did Iowa come from? And I think like, like these are things that you just have to realize, oh, it's not about North Carolina a &T. They actually did get better. And they're only going into their second race of the year. I think you'll start seeing these things solidify a little bit more in week three, four, because you'll probably see less people just improving on their season best every single week. But going from week one to two, where maybe this is just your first race in that, maybe, maybe this is your first 400-meter hurdle. I know that was for Avion Reed. Your second one may be better. Like, like That's just real, right? But also, on the other hand, when you do break it down to regional, when you do break it down to conference, you're looking at a school that is providing the best hurdlers in the CAA. Reed, Taylor, Taylor, Thomas Smith, uh, like, like all of these guys, they are some of the best hurdlers in that conference. So there's no question that A&T is the best track team or excuse me, the best hurdler specifically in that conference. It's just about. Can they go ahead and level up nationally? As we talk about national, I can't help but bring up Howard because Howard's 110 hurdle squad is the best in the nation. Samuel Bennett, third best time in the nation of anybody. These are the things that I'm talking about. These are the things that I want to highlight because for me, these are the important sports that people don't talk about. And, you know, I think I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. I want to, yeah, that, that confirmed it because I was on the fence, but yeah, tomorrow I'm going to speak about how I actually believe that track and field is the HBCU route to national acclaim, not basketball. So let's go ahead and unpack that on tomorrow's episode. But right now, we're going to take a look at the HBCU All-Star Game standouts because they shot a lot of threes in that game. They shot a lot of threes. And the standouts made a lot of threes. Who would have thought? Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. And have you ever been feeling like, man, these prices are only going to go up the closer I get to an event? And you just two days away and you try to procrastinate, procrastinate, procrastinate. Procrastination no longer bites you in the butt when you have the Game Time app. So go ahead as I'm speaking, because whether you're on podcast, whether you're on YouTube, you can always swipe out of the app and I'll still play. So as I'm talking, go ahead and go to your app store, whatever it is, download the Game Time app. And if you're new to game time, you can use the code locked on college. Please hear me because we're changing it up. You can use the code locked on college. Make sure you add that college on the end and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. It's really that simple. But so many people make it difficult. Let me simplify it for you. 
Game time, the best place, best place, best place, excuse me, for all of your last minute ticket deals. Go to Game Time, download the app, and use the code Locked On College to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked On HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day, making it all the way to segment three, and I thank you two times for that. Thank you, thank you. We've looked at North Carolina a and track and field. Apologies for the, the visual watchers. Um, I meant to put the HBCU All-Star Game as the last segment, but that's how we're going to go ahead and rock with it today. Let's get the standouts from the HBCU All-Star Game that was this past Saturday. Team Wallace, the SWAC, and the CIAA came out with the victory, and my head coach, Johnny Jones, my guy, shout out to him. My boy be clean, too, you know what I'm saying? I got to get him on the show, talk about the suits, you know? But, um... Johnny Jones uh, was a part of the winning coaching staff. And defensively, he spoke about how in the second half, they really clamped down. And you can see that in the point totals. So Team Mahorn was the other squad. And they went from scoring 56 points to only scoring 41 points. And I know we say only, but, you know, that's pretty good. You know, as, as far as all-star games go and you know the scoring output is going to be a little bit higher. And the way that we get to the scoring output, Three pointers. And I think that should be our first standout. I say I want to get into the standouts, but before we get into the standout players, I want to get into the standout statistic. There were 88 threes shot. 88 threes shot on Saturday in Phoenix, Arizona, between Team Mahorn and Team Wallace. Now, that's absolutely ridiculous to me. To me, 88 threes in a game. Doesn't make any sense. I had to go look because, you know, I'm a football guy through and through. I make no bones about it, but I do enjoy basketball the more that I get into it. Really, I'm enjoying baseball the more I get into it. But that's another story for another day. I had to go look up who shoots the most threes in the NBA team wise. And it was the Boston Celtics and the Dallas Mavericks. So I said to myself, well, how many shoot, how many threes they shot when you put them together? So I went and found their last game. It was from January. It was the last competitive game. Um, the other one was won by like 20 points or something. So I went to the last competitive game. They shot 86 threes, but they play eight extra minutes of action. So I, I look, 88 threes. They made 30 of them between Mahorn and, and Wallace. They made 30 of them. They end up shooting a better percentage than the Celtics and Mavs did. Um, but yeah, that was just crazy to me. So what a strange game. And I, Many people are probably already used to it, but the Steph Curry influence is one that still is a little bit foreign to me, so that's okay. We're going to just rock it out, and we're going to keep rolling. So let's speak about three-pointers. If we're going to speak about three-pointers being shot, who was making them? And Deshaun Dixon, or excuse me, Deshaun Dyson out of Bethune-Cookman, the game MVP, he was putting them up. He finished the game with 19 points, five three-pointers, which means 15 of his points came from behind the arc. You look at Fred Cleveland, who... He came in and he was popping them. Like, like when I tell you, he was knocking them down. He had 19 points on the day. Or excuse me, he had 20 points on the day. Banged in six three-pointers. So you, you're looking at two of the highest scores. The, um, they were number two and three. Two of the three highest scores, five threes, six threes. In total, 88 threes were put up. 30 threes were knocked down. Like, for me... It's an evolution of the game. This is not the story, but watching it, you know, you see a lot of threes, but you don't realize until after. Sometimes there's certain stats that you don't realize in the moment. But when you do, it's like, dang, 88 threes. Y'all put up 88 threes. <laughs> anyway, business-wise, the HBCU All-Star Game did sell out. So they, they had a sellout. It was over 7,000. They filled out the stadium or filled out the arena. I wish it wasn't basically the same time as the women's national championship game. Maybe we can do that next year. Um, but you take what you you take what you can for the moment. You take what you can as you build up your cachet, you build up your value, and then you can start to demand. That's how I look at it. So maybe that's just what they had to live through in 2024. Next year, we'll see. You know, like it's a changing landscape, man. I, I'm very interested to see the landscape of women's college basketball next season we'll see what the hbcu all-star game does next year round so i appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day i already told you tomorrow we'll be looking at north carolina a&t 
Howard, all of the track and field programs out there, because I believe that that's actually the sport where we need the national acclaim or we can most readily gain the national acclaim. So go ahead and watch out for that tomorrow. I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. Until the next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.